Oh, by the way, I was supposed to open them with this, but with the frantic getting over here, I told my wife the name of the class was to work and to get home on time. And she said, that's great. You should take that. <laughs> so just, yeah, just one uh, caveat there out there. Okay. I was like, no, I'm giving it. She's like, oh, God. <laughs> All right. So knowing what you're doing, know this. There isn't one answer. There isn't one answer to any one architectural project. There's no one answer. This is the Kaufman House in Palm Springs. Incidentally, it's the same client that hired, this is Richard Neutra's building, but it's the same client that hired Frank Lloyd Wright to do Falling Water, interestingly enough. Frank Lloyd Wright, super genius. When they had a chance to do another house, did they go back to Frank Lloyd Wright? No, they did not. You want repeat business, don't be in church, right? Okay. So, but that's not really the, why I'm pulling this one up. Um, Neutra House. This is the same house in both pictures. Does everybody see that immediately? Okay. This, uh, the one on the right was on the, was like the cover of Life magazine at some point in the 1960s. Um, you know, just talking about the California lifestyle. That other image is probably one of my favorite color photographs of all time. Daytime, it's about 15 feet over from the first one. I think the difference between these two images, considering the vantage, the only thing that's changed is the vantage point and the lighting in these two images, and obviously one's black and white, one's color. They're both great answers to the same problem. They're both great answers to the same piece of architecture. You just know what you're doing, you know, like you, you just, you, you, and that comes with practice, and I, I'm not trying to be facetious about it, like, but there is no one answer to what the best image for your piece of architecture is going to be. And so I think you need to keep that in mind, like, all right, because that will come back when we start talking about our workflow. There is no one answer. Like, you sitting there pounding your hand and saying you know, to the client, it has to be this way, it has to be this way, it has to be this way. You have to choose your spots where you do that because there really is no one answer. Like, you can get great images, you know, just, you can get great images doing it in, def in different ways. But there are a bunch of answers always to any one, well, not always, but there are usually some answers to any image that you can choose to do. And fundamentally for me, when I'm looking at work and when I'm saying that's good or that's bad, at some level, those people have thought, when I say good, at some level, those people have thought about how the eye travels through the canvas. And that, you know, and that's it. And, and some people don't even realize that they're doing it and they're great, you know. Some people don't even realize that they're doing it and they're great. And some people very are clearly like they know that they're doing it and they're great, you know. So, but fundamentally, that's what I'm looking at when I look at the distinction. You know, I I, I talked to Jeff at some length about what people really want to get out of the class. Like, how do you take it to that next level? Like, he's like, we want all these people to. All these people are saying like, we want to take it to the next level. The next level is not that complex. The next level is you need to think about these things as canvases, and not necessarily as 3D models. Like, that's, that's it. Like, this is the age group of who are in our industry. And you can see junior artists, 20, 20 not 29, right? What is it? Does that say 29? It does say 25. I, anyway. It's, uh, yeah. You guys know what Jeff meant, though, right? So basically, we have our industry is 85% people's in their 20s and their 30s. Now, part of that is the age of the technology, and I fully am cognizant of that. But you see, and we have personally seen, droves of people that have come through our office, and then they get out. Has everybody else seen that? They get out of the industry. No? I mean, the graph here is pretty clear that we're not alone in that, in that situation, right? Um, that people, once they start getting into their 30s, they start having families, uh, that fundamentally they get out of our industry. And because, and I, I can only surmise this, because we're not exceptionally well paid, right? We have some fun, but we're not exceptionally well paid. We also have the situation where we're just absolutely always dependent on what the client last said to us. And if your people know what they're doing, you know, those junior artists know what they're doing, you can make that 15-minute geometry change 
run it through as an XREF, save it off as an XREF, and then just restart the pass, and the whole thing is there, right? And the turnkey, and the end of the day, project manager responsibilities become so turnkey as far as I don't have to open up anything, I don't have to send anything, I just need to go in, I need to pull up monitor, and I need to restart passes. You can do that from your phone, right? Okay. Let's take a look at a couple things that probably should mention. Um, when we looked at this base pass, what we did, what we did with these, these elements here is um, usually we run a bunch of multi-mat elements. Um, and you'll see that when Gordon pulls up the file later today. Uh, and probably in the neighborhood of, uh, probably in the neighborhood of usually we, we provide room for like, for like 35 object IDs in order to be able to just adjust, to, you know, like adjustment layers in Photoshop, right? Adjustment layers in Photoshop. Um, so what those are dependent on though is your end people using object IDs for their objects that they're making, you know. Um, everybody knows how to do it. We found the best way to do it really is that you give your junior artist, like you're allowed to use one through 12 and let them make the best determination of how those object IDs are then deployed in their scenes. Because your junior artists are the ones that are fundamentally making all of the XREFs, right? So you give them, you, you give each of them one, you know, you give each of them some number to be able to do. We tried to do it at first where it was just like, you know, these types of objects would be this number, this type of object would be that number. And it just, one of, the, um, one of the things about this method is having run a shop for this long, this is our 20, 21st year, the amount of energy that we've expended on trying to get people to follow layer standards and follow object naming standards. Has everybody been there? Yeah. Did I mention object names once? You're giving your junior artists also flexibility to model as fast as they know how to model. Give them the latitude to be able to model this thing out. And then the senior artist will take a look at the passes and say, hey, you know, Josh, I really need an object ID on this. I need an object ID on this. So it completes the batch. And what that did is that it went through, it went through the base directory and it looked at all these files. And it said, if you have a, an invisible version of one of those files, it'll update it. And what it does is it just goes through all those objects in that in that base file and it it opens them up it goes through all of the objects that are in that xref and it makes them invisible then it senses what other ones from the base directory are in the mat and it opens up all of those objects and it tells it make it a v-ray mat object you open up, you go into your machine, you open up Max, you run that script on the directory. You have now matte versions of all your, of the scenes that you need matte versions of. You have invisible versions of the scenes you have invisible of. And then you um, come into your monitor and you um, activate. That's it. So the idea is then it gets rendered overnight. Passes appear next morning for the senior artists. They cobble them together, you send them off to the client, and you do it again. So basically, you can see here on the right have all of the different passes. These are all the uh, material, or I'm sorry, the object ID passes. And some of them are blank right now because it's, again, very early stages, so not everything has been addressed at this point. Uh, we have a base, or I'm sorry, a clay pass, which is just gray render, which comes in handy for various purposes. Um, lights on pass, which you can see is, there's almost no difference. There's something back here. I'm not sure what that is, but the extras basically have no lights in the scene at this point. Um, there, I'm sorry, there's the lights on pass. GI pass, nothing else. Uh, then we our regular base pass. And a slew of other passes. And a lot of times this project had um, I don't know, maybe six to ten views. I can't remember exactly. So the extras are set up in such a way that all of these passes will be handy for all the views. So there may be other views that utilize some of these these 
passes that aren't used in this actual shot. But when I get this, I will take a quick look at the pass and see if there's anything overly weird coming up. Like back in this little area, there's some blobby white mess. There's some strange mapping on these bricks at the top. You know, a, a lot of things. And this is early in the process, so it's to be expected. So you can see there's, you know, I haven't been very careful with masking or anything. I'm just trying to fill in this space with uh, a little bit of fake light just to kind of take a look at what it could look like. It's not this is like a loose sketch of where this will go in the, in the long run. And since we have all these mask layers here, the multi-mats, I can hop in and select various items in, in the file. So, for example, the, the railings and metal are all red. Some of them overlap a little bit, but not too bad. And to select these, you go in the channel menu, and you have your red, green, and blue, and they become their own alpha based on the colors in the scene. So it makes it really easy to make a quick selection uh, from those elements. And a lot of our files will have heaps of those different masks to choose from. So it keeps you from having to go and you know, trace out in Photoshop lots of little layers and tons of pieces. It could be a huge time saver in the end. And again, this file is being its, its infancy, so none of that stuff is quite prepped yet. Anything that is in your red buffer, you're going to turn that, you're going to make sure that you render your red buffer, and it's going to be slot number one. You're going to say, I want my green buffer on, and it's going to be slot number two, and then you want your blue buffer on, check, and then that's going to be slot number five. Now, so that's, uh, that's how you do object IDs. Go ahead, David. Oh, sorry, uh, David. My question is, do you set up these object IDs often based on the material on the object, um, so yeah. that you can grab all the brick at once, or all the wood paneling, or... Yeah, there are a couple ways to do it. Uh, it's, it's, so what you can do is, so that's if you're doing object IDs, you can do it that way. Multimat as, a, as an element actually works as another way too. So if I render another element, multimat. This one, I'm not going to, this second one, I'm not going to key into the object IDs. The second one, I'm going to key into material IDs. So f for this one, what we're going to do is we're going to, we'll make it another, let's see, let's go back up here for a second. Like if I draw on the on the mask for the GI pass, it'll give me shadows that just work across everything. So if I have to comp in people or cars or plants, the uh, the shadows should all work really nice. And let's say I have the uh, the cars. Let's pretend this crazy layer is the cars pass the car shadows, and then you want tree shadows. You can just make another GI pass and paint those on the other GI pass. And it looks exactly the same and blends, so you don't have to worry about overlapping shadows for your 2D people or your cars or your trees or whatever random things you want to add to your image. The, uh, the shadows all work together. So this would be, like, for example, a uh, people shadows. They all blend together, so you don't have any overlapping shadows, but you can turn them on and off as you need to. So if I want to turn off my people shadows or my plant shadows, this is a really good example. Look at this thing. So anyway, it's a, a really, really great pass to be able to take advantage of when you need it. But this image just doesn't really have that much in there right now. This is the real light on pass. Here we go. I don't know why this extra light on pass is in here. I'm going to get rid of it. I don't know if you can see on my screen. I'll turn it on and off. It just kind of helps you know feel like there's a little air catching some lights a little bit of dust in the air uh, if you want some god rays you could always just draw them in like real brutal and you know make them just come in like this and it looks crazy but you can make these look pretty good if you you know are careful with them this is going to be like i said a brutal example and and uh you use gradient and just soften them.